Thank you for coming this evening. Um, this talk's about mental health and nutrition. I do have another talk coming up next month, which is about uh, nutrition and energy levels. Um, so I've been working a lot with long COVID um, throughout the pandemic. Um, before that, I've always worked a lot with energy and you know, post-viral fatigue um, because of my own history. So it's an area I really enjoy discussing. We're also talking about energy in general and the different things that can, can drive low energy. But tonight is about mental health and nutrition. So a little bit about me. There I am. Um, I'm a nutritionist registered with BANT. I primarily work in a one-to-one -one clinical setting. So obviously before the pandemic, I was in clinics. Um, since then, I've been working uh, remotely. So I work with people in different countries. So I'm based in the UK, um, but I do work with people um, across Europe and in the um, America and Canada as well. Um, so primarily what I do is working one to one. So helping people understand, you know, the root cause of their symptoms and trying to join all the dots up together. Uh, there's no system in the body that works in isolation. They're all related to one another. And um, sometimes when we've had maybe conditions that have been with us for a long time or maybe we have multiple conditions it can be difficult on our own to kind of pinpoint what's what's going on there and, and how to really support things so it's my job to kind of be a bit of a detective and, and pull everything together and then support that through things like meal planning and, and supplements and I do a lot of functional medicine testing as well so stool testing hormone testing allergy um, things like that cortisol um, aside from that, I do a lot of um, content creation work, so um, often work with um, magazines and newspapers or brands and sort of uh, writing for them and, and um, that kind of thing. And I do work as well with um, different companies, so corporate wellness kind of talks like this, but in a workplace um, so a little bit about myself, I um, had absolutely no interest at all in nutrition um, in any shape or form. I used to work in the um, creative arts industry and in HR in London, and I had a pretty sort of, you know, standard kind of diet and um, I didn't really, yeah, didn't really think too much about, about nutrition. I didn't really know that my job kind of existed um, that I have now. Um, but I became really unwell with a condition called fibromyalgia. So at my worst point, I would have pain from head to toe, um, you know, burning sensation, just like constant pain, uh, really severe fatigue. I had to, you know, find it very difficult to work and socialize and all that kind of stuff. Um, and alongside that, of course, with a condition like that, I also um, had struggles with uh, mental health, you know, I struggle with anxiety, health anxieties, especially, um, you know, low mood. Um, and I had tried lots of different medications and different things and different therapies and nothing was really make a difference for me. So I thought, well, I'll just try changing my diet and see if that helps. Um, and long story short, it, it really did help. And I've been um, without symptoms from fibromyalgia for um, many years now. And so that's, you know, a big area that I work with. And part of why I've ended up working a lot with long COVID because of my own um, history with, you know, post-viral fatigue and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also have PCOS, which is a hormone condition that I manage uh, with diet and lifestyle. So, um, like I said, you know, mental health is a real area that I'm really fond of working in. I work with it so often. And I think there's a lot that we can do with our diet we maybe aren't aware of. Of course, with mental health is a very complex topic it's not as simple as you know you eat a banana and then you have no anxiety ever again um but there's you know understanding the way that our systems work um can be really helpful at really managing things and feeling a little bit more in control of the situation so tonight we'll be talking about um what the nervous system is itself i will go over a little bit some of the key nervous system features uh some of the, the big hormones involved in the, the big neurotransmitters um, I think hopefully it won't feel too much like a biology lesson, but I do feel maybe just because this is the only way I was able to make changes to my own diet is that it's really useful to understand why we're making the changes that we're making or why we're eating in a certain way um, and have some context behind what the body needs and what it's going through when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling anxious, so that you can then make changes which are going to be more sustainable. 
Um, we'll also talk about the nervous system and other body systems. So how the um, your, your anxiety levels, for example, relate to your digestion. And I'll just touch on fostering a positive relationship with food and then um, how we can influence the nervous system with uh, lifestyle and food. And then we'll finish up with some questions. So um, if you know, you're a client of mine that was watching tonight, um, or if you've been to any other talks of mine before, you'll know I'm always saying that we are all unique. You know, I have very often will work with, say, maybe something like PCOS or long COVID, and I don't have anyone on the exact same protocol. Everyone is different. You're not your condition. You know, you're not just sort of your symptoms. You've got your own complex history. And so understanding you know, what happens to us in our, in our, in our history there can be really helpful and, you know, actually supporting current symptoms. So we're all a little bit complex. Um, we're all unique. Um, and, you know, really what happens in one area of the body is going to impact another area. And um, we'll go through kind of examples of that tonight. So what is the nervous system? The nervous system essentially is where you um, where you create your sleep and your stress hormones. It's in, responsible for your memory, your thoughts and your feelings, you know, learning, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's also where we process pain and movement. Um, and we have these two, the big states that we go between sympathetic and parasympathetic, which we're going to spend a little bit of time going over now. So you may have heard of the sympathetic versus parasympathetic before. Uh, one, sympathetic is your fight or flight, and parasympathetic is the opposite of that. And understanding these two um, areas can be really helpful at supporting your health, be it your immune health, your digestion, your nervous system itself, or your hormones. So sympathetic, this is your fight or flight. When you're in fight or flight, something called your HPA axis, which we're going to go through in a little bit, is, uh, is switched on. And when you're in that in, in that state, your body does not necessarily know kind of where that stress is coming from. It doesn't know if you're in physical, you know, if you're going to be in physical danger, if it's emotional, if it's work. It just knows, OK, we're maybe in danger. We're in a fight or flight. We're in survival mode. And, you know, it's absolutely necessary to our to and essential to our survival that we have this state of our nervous system it's what helps you when you're crossing the road and you hear a car coming and you just jump back that was just your you've switched into that sympathetic mode you've got your cortisol and got your adrenaline pumping you can feel it in your heart that you needed that but we don't need to be in that state all the time but because of our lifestyles most of us do spend a lot of time in fight or flight and when that when we're in that state you know, we can get into chronic stress and that can then lead into chronic health conditions. So when you're in that fight or flight state, as I said, your body's really geared up and really focused in on that surviving. So you'll have an increased heart rate, your digestion is inhibited, your blood uh, flow is diverted from the gut. Um, so your digestion almost shuts down, um, your hormones um, are put on the back burner, your immune system as well. So because you have to think if you really were in physical danger, if you really were jumping back from hearing a car coming in the middle of the road, it wouldn't make sense for you to be trying to, you know, get pregnant or to fight off a cold or digest your breakfast that you had. It would make sense for your body to just completely focus on trying to get you out of that situation. So when you're in sympathetic state in a small period of time, absolutely fine. But when you're spending a lot of time there because perhaps you have chronic stress, or, you know, the pandemic, I think most of us were spending a great deal of time in this state, that's where it starts to become problematic, because your immune system can become suppressed, your digestion is, um, is, is inhibited, and your, um, your hormones as well, and that's just, you know, a very small part of the picture. So in the sympathetic state, it's your adrenaline and your cortisol that are really dominant. So they're, they're the big, the big players at that point. And you can feel them when you're sitting at work or maybe you're feeling overwhelmed. If you've ever had a panic attack, you can feel that in your chest. It's like a, almost like an, like an adrenaline, like you want to make a run for it, but you're actually just at your desk feeling overwhelmed. But that's what's happening. Now, the other side of it is your parasympathetic state. So parasympathetic, if, if sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is like rest and digest. So this point your heart rate is decreased, you know, you don't have that constricted blood flow, your digestion is stimulated, your reproductive system is nice and happy, your immune system is working really well, and everything is more relaxed. 
So at this point, your GABA and your dopamine are the two big chemicals that are sort of in charge of this side of your immune system. So a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is how to spend more time in the parasympathetic state to support your overall health, but also just those feelings of anxiety um, and you know low mood, things like that. So you have these chemicals. So GABA, you may have heard of GABA before and dopamine. Um, you know, there's a lot of work out there at the moment, which is great to see about ADHD and adult ADHD. And dopamine is the really big, uh, important neurotransmitter in that, um, in that environment. We often will see people with ADHD who have low levels of dopamine. And in children, we see that um, reward seeking behavior where they may be hyperactive or they're you know, playing up at school, that kind of thing. In adults, we can sometimes see where we're looking to get that dopamine. Um, we might be doing more impulsive things, maybe like shopping or binge eating, um, that kind of stuff. And our bodies are really great at helping you find a way to just get whatever it needs at that time. And if you need dopamine and maybe you have nutrient deficiencies, maybe your dopamine levels are low, then the body will say, okay, where else can we get dopamine? And one of the quickest ways to get it from a dietary point is chocolate. So, you know, when you, you get chocolate and you, you have that kind of nice little, it feels quite good. And as you get dopamine when you shop, for example, you also get dopamine when you're ticking things off a to-do list as well, when you've completed a task. So we make dopamine in response to things, but we also make it ourselves and we get it from food. And then GABA is the other side of it. So this is also an anxiety and a fear antagonist. So it kind of competes against that cortisol um, stressed out feeling. GABA is very important. Um, we think about hormonal health. Um, we'll often see lower levels of GABA during perimenopause and postmenopause, as well as conditions like PCOS because of the levels of progesterone changing. Uh, progesterone and GABA are very much involved with one another. Um, and so that's why some conditions like PCOS, which typically have low progesterone, have higher instances of anxiety. Yeah. And then the other kind of side of your nervous system is the serotonin pathway. So your serotonin is your happy hormone. It's also a pain antagonist. And often when I work with people um, who have maybe chronic pain conditions uh, clinically, I, there's a panel that I run which looks at um, all the neurotransmitters. So it looks at your serotonin and your dopamine and all that kind of stuff. And we often will see people with chronic pain conditions have low levels of serotonin. Um, and so that's, you know, because of its role with it being a pain antagonist, which basically means it fights against pain. And serotonin turns into melatonin. Melatonin is your big sleep hormone. Um, so in some countries, people can take melatonin. It's not legal here in the UK. Um, but I know some people take it. We can get it on prescription, but not over the counter here. And then cortisol. So cortisol is your stress hormone. Now, of course, we think about cortisol as this big bad villain and, you know, cortisol is so bad and all this kind of stuff, but we do need cortisol. Like I said, it is there um, to protect you and it is there as part of your, you know, it's your alert hormone. You do need it. You need it for your focus and for learning as well, but we just don't want it to have too much of a good thing. Um, and then you have adrenaline, which is, you know, that heart rate and stress response. It's tied up with that fight or flight. Now, another chemical which doesn't often get spoken about, but I think it's really important to just spend a quick moment talking about is something called quinoloic acid. So we make quinoloic acid as a byproduct in energy production, but when we have too much of it, we can start to cause um, cell death and toxicity and high glutamate. And glutamate, which we'll talk about later, um, which is in food is called MSG, is a neuroexcitery and um, can contribute into feelings of anxiety and, and headaches and things like that. Um, it's produced in higher amounts when we have inflammation and actually inflammation can cause a cortisol response. So we can kind of get a little stuck in a bit of a cycle and it can be about trying to switch that cycle off a little bit. But quinoloic acid, um, acid is, is significant. And, uh, you know, for some people, if there's um, infection or an immune response, then they're more likely to go down this, um, down this pathway also when they're um, creating uh, serotonin themselves. So anxiety and stress. So, you know, in a very, very simplified version, of course, mental health is very, very complex. Um, but in a, on a chemical level, depression is usually associated with low circulating serotonin and anxiety is normally high cortisol, low dopamine and, and or low GABA. So this is something called a HPA axis, which you may have read about before. It refers to the adrenals, which you also may have heard of. 
So your HPA axis is essentially the, how the body responds to stress. So these little arrows here is pointing to two parts of the brain. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So you have stress coming in externally. So this might be at home, you're trying to do a million things or you're, you're worried about something or you have your kids are you know running all over the place. But also internally from inflammation or inflammatory drivers, so things that maybe low-grade allergies, infection, or if you have a pain condition, there's lots of inflammation, like rheumatoid arthritis, that kind of thing, that's going to have the same impact. It's, they're both switching on that HPA axis. And when that is switched on, that's when you go into that fight or flight response. So you can, when you see it this way, you can understand hopefully how it's so easy that we spend so much time in fight or flight, so much time in that sympathetic state, because you can have these constant sort of, you know, switching on, knocking on the door of the adrenals saying something's happening, something's happening. And it's not always that you're in physical danger. It can just be, you have a very stressful job or you're juggling a hundred things, your work-life balance is, is really tricky, or you have inflammatory conditions or pro-inflammatory foods coming in. So when this is switched on, that's where you start to produce your cortisol. And it's absolutely fine, like I said, in small doses, but where it can start to become a little bit more problematic is where we start to have it interfering with your hormones, for example, because your adrenal glands also create on the right here, DHEA, which is a really important part of your hormone um, cascade uh, for your androgens. So things like testosterone um, is, is all tied up in that. So we can often see, um, you know, this, this axis being very heavily implicated in things like PCOS. And in men, we often will see it um, difficulties around maybe sex drive, um, erectile dysfunction or low levels of testosterone. Often the HPA axis is involved in that. Um, so that's, you know, a really strong link it has in with your hormones. And this is actually a little section. It's just an example test. It's not a client of mine um, from a hormone test that I do where we actually collect someone's um, urine across an entire month. And so we can see their estrogen and progesterone. Um, but within that panel, there is this big section on the nervous system, which I think really illustrates how close there is a relationship between your nervous system and your sex hormones. So um, in here, we can see what your cortisol should be doing throughout the day. So we wake up and your cortisol um, should jump up about half an hour later to its highest point. It's going to be all day. So this is kind of like when you wake up and you're in bed and you're kind of dozing and then half an hour later, you're like, right, I can get up. So part of what's happening at that point is your cortisol is boosting and then it gets lower and then it gets lower again. And then nighttime should be its absolute lowest point. Uh, what I often see, I test cortisol um, with people in my clinic is that, was, you know, they might have a depressed pattern. So you're waking up and actually the cortisol is getting lower in the morning or sometimes it's really, really, you know, it's above the reference range and it's spending a lot of time being really high and people feeling really anxious. Or sometimes at nighttime when it should be getting lower, it's actually getting higher. You can see that that's happening a little bit here with this sample test. So understanding your cortisol pattern can be really helpful as well. And it's really a good um, indicator of what's going on uh, with the adrenals. So well, how can we get into this state with this um, high levels of cortisol? So, you know, we can have overstressed or if we're overstimulated, you know, with things like caffeine is very stimulating, with certain sugars, that kind of stuff, very stimulating. Um, but we, most of us have very busy lifestyles, very stressful jobs. We have a learned stress response. Um, and it is very difficult these days to switch off. I think, you know, we have, you're at work all day, looking maybe at a screen, or you're engaged all day and then you're in the evening, we're then looking maybe at more screens and then we have our phones and all the apps are designed to try and keep you on as long as possible. So all of that is very stimulating for the nervous system. So it's really hard for us to kind of switch off um, like compared to what it was, I think even maybe 10 years ago. So that's definitely so that's something we have to kind of manage ourselves. Um, certain exercises can stimulate that HPA axis, um, things like HIT um or you know sprinting things like that can be quite aggressive on the adrenals uh, normally when i'm working with someone who's maybe is on the anxious side um or someone who has something like pcos would often encourage them to think about more um, low impact sports or exercises that don't get their heart rate really really high um to support their nervous system a little bit so high levels of cortisol chronically are associated with a couple of different things. So um, poor sleep, of course, because your cortisol is to make you feel alert. So it doesn't make sense that you would be then feeling sleepy, you know, when you have high cortisol, increased anxiety, 
hormone disruption, which we've covered. Uh, weight gain is also associated with cortisol, particularly in the midsection and heart disease risk. So, you know, thinking about what's happening when you're in that um, fight or flight response, your, your blood vessels are constricted, you know, and there's, there's that more uh, higher blood pressure, which is then going to put you at risk of heart disease uh, in the long run. So serotonin, your happy hormone, is made in the central nervous system. It's also made in your gut. So what's happening in the gut health is very closely related to, um, to serotonin and um, 95% of it is actually um, your guts involved in the production of that, which I think is really interesting. Um, there was actually a study that was done um, called the Anxious Mice Study, and uh, they got um, mice and they had a collection of mice who were sort of acting more anxious and then mice who were sort of calmer and they um, did a transplant of their gut microbiome from one group to the other and observed there was a, a great behavioral difference uh, when they did that so again of course we are maybe more complex than mice well who's to say maybe mice are very complex emotional beings I don't know um, but uh, you know, I think it does illustrate that there is a relevance of what's going on in the gut health with our mental health um, and, the, and the way that we feel um, anxiety and, and stress. So in your serotonin production line, you have multiple stages and it all starts with an amino acid. An amino acid is basically from protein that goes from one thing into another into another and eventually turns into serotonin. So tryptophan, the greatest source of that is turkey. So, you know, when you feel happy at Christmas and, tur and uh, Thanksgiving, um, and eventually it goes along and it turns into your serotonin. But you need these things called cofactors to help you take that tryptophan and go from one thing into another, into another, and eventually pop out and make this nice, lovely serotonin. So you need zinc, iron, calcium, magnesium, all the B vitamins, vitamin C and omega-3. So if you're deficient in even just a handful of, or a couple of these, you can really start to feel it in the nervous system. And I think that something I really observe in my clinical practice is that people are very comfortable with the idea of having low levels of iron or having low levels of B vitamins. But, you know, we can have low levels of GABA and we can have low levels of serotonin and in the same way that you would eat maybe to support these um, these particular, you know, iron levels and all that kind of stuff. You can you can eat and supplement to support your um, your nervous system chemicals too. So it's really important to think about that food chain within the melatonin and serotonin production line, but also just as crucial to think about the cofactors. Um, I don't get into in my talks. Uh, recommending specific supplements to people because everyone is different and medications and existing conditions it's just not safe for me to do so. Um, but what I would say is don't start experimenting on yourself on these pathways. You know, if you were to, you could think about maybe the cofactors, but I wouldn't um, for safety reasons, you know, there's, it's easy to access a lot of things these days, which is, is good, but it's kind of bad at the same time because you could potentially take something that's not going to agree with you or be unsafe with the medication. But this is the pathway here. On the other side, you have your dopamine pathway. So again, you have your protein and that goes all the way along and then you pop out and you make dopamine at the end. And it's the same cofactors on either side on the serotonin pathway and the dopamine pathway. They have the same cofactors in the middle that are supporting your body and, and creating these nice, lovely, calming, happy chemicals. So your nervous system and the rest of the body. Now, how are they all related to one another? And there's that overlap that I spoke about. So your nervous system impacts other areas of the body. And equally, your other areas of your body can impact your nervous system. Like I said, with that anxious mice study that was done, um, or we can see when you're in fight or flight mode, it inhibits your digestion. Um, and this can have sort of a long, you know, wider reaching um, implications. So you think, you know, many of us, when we feel anxious or stressed or scared, we'll have maybe butterflies in the stomach or stomach cramps, or some people might have constipation or loose stools or really extreme examples might actually throw up. So you can really close relationship there between the gut and, and, um, and your stomach, but it can actually, for something chronic, can start to become a, um, you know, a, a more uh, systemic, a wide reaching um, uh impact on the body. So for example, if you are someone who's spending lots of time in fight or flight, you're not going to be digesting your food that well. So you're not going to get the nutrients from your food, which then means you're going to be potentially becoming nutrient deficient. 
And as we saw, you need some key nutrients to make your chemicals to help keep you feel calm, if that makes sense. So it all kind of can get, again, sort of a little bit stuck. So we really want to think about working down at the core of things and really trying to work on that parasympathetic um, support system as much as we can. Um, so this section, we're talking about how gut health has um, or may play an important role in irritable bowel syndrome and functional constipation. Um, so as I said, you know, digestion really does slow down when you're spending time in that fight or flight mode. Um, and, you know, your gut bacteria makes nearly 95% of your serotonin, which is huge, huge, huge amount. And that's got a big influence on your mood and your GI activity. So things like constipation as well. Um, I actually sometimes find with really stubborn cases of constipation in my clinic. Um, but we've tried everything. When I start working on the serotonin pathways, that's where we can start to see um, things moving along, which is, I think, really interesting um, to note. Um, so this is around the nervous system and hormones. We did touch on this, so we went through the HPA axis. Um, but as I said, elevated cortisol levels can, um, you know, can really influence your hormone levels, and that can go into things like arousal um, in both men and women. And it's because your adrenal glands are producing um, that androgenic sex hormones like testosterone for you. And again, it makes sense if you just think about it with you know that being in that survival mode it wouldn't make sense that you if you were in physical danger would be trying to you know get pregnant or make someone pregnant really well maybe some people respond to stress that way but i don't think most people would um so again it, it does make sense from your body's point of view if it thinks it's in an in an emergency situation it's not going to have that focus on, on your hormonal health we also see, you know, something that I get asked so often, uh, you know, why is my, mo my mood so low and I have high anxiety before a period, what's going on there? Um, and that's, again, because of that GABA and progesterone relationship. So it's it's normal to be a little bit lower in your mood, a little bit more anxious before a period starting. But what's not normal is when it gets to a point where you're, you know, really impacting your life and, you know, you're so planning a social calendar around it. That That's not normal. That's not healthy, but it's fine to feel a little different in your hormones. Um, I did a couple of talks this year about, um, about hormones specifically, uh, different conditions around perimenopause, PCOS, and just general hormonal health. And I spent quite a bit of time talking about that relationship again um, between there. And you can have the quote unquote perfect diet and take all the right supplements. You're still going to be a human woman at the end of the day and <laughs> have your hormones going up and down. So it's fine to feel that fluctuation, but it's, you know, to, to, to a smaller extent. Um, TSH on here, so that's thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, and that's your, your thyroid is like the first almost domino effect in your thyroid production. Your thyroid is a uh, gland just here in the throat and it's involved in your, your weight regulation, your energy, your hair, your skin, your nails, um, your, um, uh, your energy levels, um, even things like mood can be impacted, digestion. And when you're spending a lot of time in fight or flight and have lots of cortisol, it actually starts to impact your thyroid function because it starts um, almost sort of messing around with the TSH um, production and the conversion of one hormone into another within the thyroid. Um, you actually start to make something called reverse T3, which is reverse uh, one of the thyroid hormones so it's kind of what it sounds like where you're actually kind of stealing almost hormone from yourself when you're in that state of stress so sometimes um again in, in my clinical practice i i'll test all five markers within the thyroid and um in the nhs and only will just test two tsh and t4 um but what they don't test T3, um, and that's actually the most active form of the thyroid, and that's the one that gets influenced a lot with stress. So um, something definitely to think about. And again, you can get in touch with me to discuss that further. Um, so with your immune system, chronically high cortisol can suppress the immune system. So then going to put you at increased risk of viral infections, allergies, and possibly even autoimmune conditions. So your immune system is involved in fighting off colds, all that kind of stuff. It's also involved in helping your body differentiate what's called self versus non-self, um, where that starts to fail is where you start to see autoimmune conditions um, developing. And, you know, chronic stress can definitely be in, in the lead up to, um, to that. And I very often, when I'm doing case taking an initial appointment with clients, it's a full hour. So we have a lot of time to go through their history as well as their current state with their health. Um, 
And almost always in autoimmune conditions, there'll be, um, you know, a history of stress or maybe a traumatic event like a bereavement um, or something like that in their in their history. So um, with the nervous system and hunger or weight, uh, chronically high cortisol can lead to weight gain and fat deposits around the face and the stomach. Visceral um, uh, visceral fat is, is where it's in the, is in the stomach, in the midsection, and they actually have more receptors to cortisol. So once they start to deposit there, they're going to be more sensitive to, to cortisol and they're kind of on the lookout for that stress. Um, and it's also when you're highly stressed, you have um, less tolerance almost to sugar in the diet. Your blood sugar becomes more dysfunctional. And when your blood sugar is high, you start to store the sugar into the fat cells. So you know, if you've ever worked with me or if you do work with me and we're talking about weight, is so much more than you know, how many calories are you eating? You know, it's about your cortisol levels, your hormones, your blood sugar and your thyroid. Um, and, and cortisol has got such a huge, big influence on um, how our body holds on to weight and how it processes it. So something that can put a lot of pressure on the nervous system um, as far as diets are uh, really low calorie diets. So you know, if you're eating 1200 calories a day, that is not enough that um, you keep often if people come to me to lose weight and I'm asking them about calories, I don't get them to count calories, but I'll say to them, you know, you need to be eating more than that. And it feels very alien, but actually eating higher than that normally will help them to lose weight because of that impact that low calorie diets really put on the nervous system. Also intermittent fasting. Now for some people, intermittent fasting is a great dietary model and works really well for them. Um, but for, for a lot of people, you know, it can be tough on the adrenals. It does Put, the, put you into a little bit of a stress state in the body. And so if you've got any level of anxiety or you know low mood, it's definitely not something I recommend clinically. So it's not coming into winter. So put your hand up if you're taking your vitamin D because you all should be at this point. Um, in the months of October through till March, you can go outside every day in uh, England and Scotland and Wales in your bikini and you're not gonna really make any vitamin D. The sun's just not strong enough. And it puts you at risk of a condition called SAD, which is seasonal affective disorder. So um, this can really influence your mood and your energy. Um, vitamin D is fat soluble. So you will build up a store of it in the summer and then you start to you know, work through it in the winter months. Um, so you don't want to get down to that bottom layer. You want to make sure you've got nice levels coming through. You can get vitamin D in food, but not very easily. So it's best to just take a supplement. Um, like I said, most you know NHS and, and government guidelines recommend everyone to take one. Um, so it's definitely something to think about there. So just very briefly, how to have a positive relationship with food. So as I said, I got into nutrition very reluctantly. It was my absolute last re uh, resort. I did, did not want to change my diet really. Um, and... I think I put a lot of that into how I work with my clients. Um, I my background is Italian, you know, so I've got wine and olive oil running through my blood. You know, I don't really like to not be eating these. This what to me feels like really, you know, nourishing and uh, really comforting food. Um, so I like to, you know, help people eat in a way that's going to feel like a lifestyle and not going to feel like a diet because a diet has to end at some point. And for many of us, we maybe have health conditions that we need to learn how to manage for our whole lives. So it's about, you know, making that nice, positive relationship with food. So, you know, perfection is not the goal. What we're thinking about is eating mostly for the body. So what we're going to go into the next section is if you're, if your big focus is your nervous system, this is how you can eat to support your parasympathetic state. It's how you can eat to support your hormones, for example, spending a lot of your time eating in that way. And then 10% of the time or 20%, you're eating more for the soul. So for me, I have pizza and wine pretty much every Friday. It's like clockwork is happening for me, okay? And that I know that that alcohol and all that kind of stuff is not really doing anything good for my body, but it's making me really happy. Or maybe it's a social thing and that's got a big benefit to it. And that's absolutely fine. And doing things like that is what makes it all feel sustainable for me and for when I'm working with my clients. So we're thinking more about that and less about, you know, this is bad food. I'm trying to be good because when you start to associate those negative words with foods, then you're going to end up fostering, you know, really negative relationship with, with food in general and you end up dieting. And, and they, we just have so many, so much research out there that just shows that diets just don't work. So it's really about trying to work on that relationship. 
with the food and thinking about, okay, I'm eating, focusing more on what you are eating as opposed to what you're not eating. So thinking, okay, we'll go through in a moment, like, okay, so I need to have some nice protein that's going to support my adrenals, which is going to help my stress levels and thinking about it like that, instead of thinking, oh, this is terrible for me. So I'm not going to eat this. And then you eat it and you feel really guilty, you know? So the other thing is understanding what your body is trying to tell you. So like I said, with those chocolate cravings, if that's something that you get, you know, is your body perhaps low in dopamine? Is that maybe becoming from the fact that you don't have enough vitamin C or that there's B deficiencies or iron deficiencies and your body's looking for ways to, to support that, that need? Um, do you have low levels of progesterone? Is there something wrong with your hormones? Is that where this is coming from? So actually digging in, which I said is kind of you can do it yourself or we could work together and we can try and figure it out between the two of us. You know, where is this, where is this need coming from? Um, because our bodies are really smart. Your body is very intelligent. If it's, if you're craving something regularly, it's not for no reason. It's coming from somewhere and it can often be maybe from the blood sugar levels are, are too low or there's deficiencies and your body's trying to find a way to help you through it. So let's learn how we can eat for our nervous system. So, one thing you really want to think about when you're thinking about your parasympathetic state, which is that lovely rest and digest, so the opposite to fight or flight, is your blood sugar balance. We're going to go through that in a second. And vagus nerve stimulation. So I definitely, as I said, was not interested in health and nutrition in any shape or form. And I used to think when you were stressed and someone would say, deep, take a deep breath, I was like, that's not going to do anything. But you basically, if you, this is something called the vagus nerve, and this is big, great big nerve that goes down sort of the kind of the base of your head and goes all the way down past your diaphragm. And when you breathe in a way that the diaphragm pushes up against this vagus nerve, it stimulates it and it actually starts to communicate and win with this HPA axis and suppresses cortisol production. So it's very easy to do. We're all going to do it together now. No one can see you, so you don't need to worry about it, about being shy. Put your hands on your ribs either side and take in a deep breath so that you feel your ribs pushing up against your hands for four seconds, okay? You hold for four seconds if you can, and then you breathe out for four seconds again. So we'll do it again. Just put your hands on your ribs and just breathe in for four seconds. Yeah, holding for four, three, two, one, and then out for four seconds, okay? So all you need to do is remember the number four. So you're in for four, holding for four if it's comfortable, breathing out for four, four times. And that is enough to stimulate that vagus nerve and to suppress um, the cortisol production. It really helps when you're feeling quite stressed. So you can do that as the first thing you do when you wake up, before you start scroll, doom scrolling you know, on Twitter or when you're making a cup of tea, just standing at the kettle and doing that kind of breathing. If you're at work, just take yourself off. Even if you can, you can do it before you eat your meal. So you're signaling to your body, okay, we're not in fight or flight. You know, this is really good if you eat in the middle of the work day. We, you know, we can get digestive enzymes flowing, all that kind of stuff. So it's a very easy thing, very cheap. It's just breathing. But a lot of us don't actually deep uh, breathe very deeply. So even now, for example, when I'm talking, I'm just breathing shallow breathing. I'm just breathing up the top of my chest. I'm not actually breathing for, for, further enough into my um, lungs to have my diaphragm really pushing up against my vagus nerve. So at the moment, my diaphragm's just kind of here and the vagus nerve, they're just kind of looking at each other, but there's not really any engagement happening. Um, the other thing you can do is interacting with animals. So lots of studies have shown that um, petting an animal or interacting with them helps uh, produce or helps with serotonin and dopamine production, as does um, spending time in nature and yoga and meditation are also helpful for this. So for all of my type A people out there who are like me, I cannot do meditation to save my life. I do not find it relaxing. I actually find it the opposite because I feel like, you know, I should be relaxing. I should be, you know, all this kind of stuff. So mindfulness doesn't have to be yoga. It doesn't have to be meditation. It just needs to be something that you're in really engaged in what you're doing. So for me, I will garden in the morning, potter around before work in the garden, or I'll maybe be making something with my hands. And that is something that I'm really focused in on. Gardening is a great tool to do for that. As actually been studies have shown that the um, engaging in gardening affects your microbiome and can then support your mental health. So don't feel as though you have to do 
put yourself in a box of what that meditation or mindfulness looks like. It's all about balance and finding what feels good for you. It can also be, you know, doing your skincare and spending ages doing a facial massage on yourself or lymphatic drainage with dry brushing. It doesn't have to be something that you're kind of forcing yourself into. It should be something that you enjoy. So eating for serotonin. So addressing your gut health definitely is important. So if you have IBS, uh, if you've had lots of medications, if you're taking antibiotics, thinking about that, get in touch with me. <laughs> um, vitamin D is important. Thinking about your adrenal health and your blood sugar balance, which we are going to go through blood sugar balance in more detail towards the end. So your protein with your nervous system across the board, protein is very, very important. Your adrenals love protein. So thinking about lean proteins in general, but tryptophan, which if you remember is at the, the top of that food chain with creating serotonin, um, is a really great um, amino acid to try and get in the diet. So turkey um, and chicken are the absolute top sources of that. But in other um, non-vegetarian um, uh, sources, uh, banana, cottage cheese, and nuts as well. So magnesium, now I use magnesium as a supplement, probably more than any other supplement in my entire clinical work. Um, and there's lots of different forms of it. So not so everyone's on the same one, but most of my clients are taking, <laughs> taking a form of magnesium. I'm taking magnesium, uh, we all are. Um, but from a food point of view, you get it in dark leafy greens, it's in brown rice, it's in beans, and it's in whole grains and fish. And that's really important for that cofactor. If you remember up the side of actually creating those nice hormones. Protein, as I've said, so we're thinking about um, those nice lean proteins. If you're vegetarian, you think about beans and tofu. You can put protein powders through your smoothies. Um, and uh, that's an easy way if you're vegetarian to get that in. Or if you're not vegetarian. Folic acid and B6. So these are two B vitamins. Um, again, leafy greens coming through, broccoli, chickpeas and chicken. Um, they're all the nice sources to get these foods from. Omega-3. So your brain is very much made of fat. So you want to be eating nice, lovely fats to support that nice fat brain of yours. Yeah, a nice fatty brain. So uh, oily fish like salmon and anchovies, sardines, uh, walnuts, chia seeds, olive oil and avocado are all really nice sources of um, omega-3. Vitamin C. So vitamin C is actually really important for your nervous system. And I put citrus fruits here, but they always get all the attention. But actually kiwi fruit, um, generally speaking, have more vitamin C content in them than oranges. So kiwis are a really nice thing to get through. Also really helpful if you're um, someone who has constipation, just completely tangent there. But if you do have constipation, kiwi fruit is very helpful getting the bowels moving also in children too. Uh, and thinking about your gut. So fermented food in this photo here is kimchi, which um, I love. I have kimchi um, almost every day on something. I had it with scrambled eggs <laughs> today, actually. Um, but fermented food doesn't have to be fancy. You know, it can be uh, olives would be considered to be fermented food as well. And prebiotic foods. So probiotic foods are foods that have bacteria in them. And then prebiotic foods are foods that feed the bacteria in the gut. So it's going to be leeks, onions, oats are all really rich sources of prebiotics. And limiting your caffeine and alcohol because it does influence your gut health. And identifying your individual food sensitivities is very important. You, you know, might have a food sensitivity, something that maybe I don't. So it's not about there being, like I said, one perfect diet for everyone. But in identifying, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, you feel unwell after certain foods, why is that? What are those foods that are triggers for you? So food to limit. So remember, these are the foods that are not off limits. It's just about these are maybe more for your happiness and for your soul, as opposed to maybe so much for your nervous system. So sugar uh, increases inflammation and that includes inflammation across the whole board, across the whole body, including in the brain, which feels like a strange concept, but it can influence um, inflammation there. But remembering back with that HPA axis, that inflammation triggers the HPA response. So sometimes people can maybe don't notice there's a relationship, but actually when they have sugar, it can increase feelings of anxiety. So this graph here, this uh, image, sorry, this is to signify your blood sugar. So you only need one teaspoon of sugar from head to toe any given time. It's not that much. So when you have more than that, your body, your insulin starts to go up, as I said. So when your insulin's up, you start to put some uh, sugar into the fat cells for storage, but you'll start to, um, 
you know, you, you can feel quite racy and it has a relationship with your nervous system. And then what happens is, you know, because it's gone up so high, it's going to drop down again. And that's going, excuse me, to then put you into a crash. And then you're going to need more sugar to come back up again. So you're spending lots of time going up and down. It's quite disruptive to, um, to your energy levels, your sex hormones, um, Again, if I'm thinking that relationship between your hormones and your nervous system, when you have high levels of insulin, you start to um, make lower levels of something called sex hormone binding globulin, which is this protein that's in charge of your testosterone, your estrogen. So if you're maybe insulin resistant or you're just maybe eating sugar uh, often or you're eating carbs on their own, you're spending lots of time in the state, then it can really start to influence your um, your hormone levels. And we know, as we said, that your hormone levels can influence your anxiety and they can all get all linked up together. So what you want to do is when you eat something with sugar in it, you have your protein beforehand, you've got some fats, you've got some vegetables in your stomach. It's not that sugar's coming in on its own on an empty stomach. It's got something in there. So the blood sugar is already anchored. So something else um, are highly processed foods. Um, so that reduces um, something called BDNF, which is important for your long-term memory and for the growth of new neurons in the brain. And high mercury foods, so tuna is not off limits, but maybe not having it every single day. Um, it's too, uh, Mercury is a heavy metal and heavy metals can um, interact with the nervous system a little bit there. So MSG, MSG is an, as a neurostimulant and it's very often used in takeaway foods and as an additive to enhance flavors. So Pringles, I believe, still use it. I think Doritos have them. And there's a reason, you know, when you have one and it just tastes like the best thing in the world that you've ever had and you can't stop eating them, okay? It's because the MSG is a neurostimulant. So it's stimulating your brain and it's saying, this tastes amazing. Let's have more and more of it. So again, you know, it's for some people that can be a bit much. And I often will see clients who are sensitive to MSG into that nervous system pathway. If they're maybe after they have um, certain takeout foods, they maybe have a headache afterwards or they can have a puffiness in the face. These people are typically quite sensitive. But for everyone, MSG is a neurostimulant. But to some people, that's more significant than, than to others. Um, and then another one are um, uh, artificial sweeteners. So if you're having things like um, Diet Coke, you know, every day, um, they're impair your, um, your, your, um, your neuro pathways a little bit. Um, and actually with artificial sweeteners, they do impact the blood sugars. This doesn't happen straight away, but it, it can lead into um, a, a spike and a crash later. Um, so that's also something to think about. Um, and then alcohol, of course, is an uh, in, inflammatory and a nutrient um, depletion. Although I don't know why I picked that photo because it makes me look like that. I, I want to have a drink. <laughs> look at that because it looks like a good time. As I said, it's not about no alcohol ever, but just understanding the impact it has um, on the body there. And then caffeine. So I always work this into every single talk I do on any topic is about caffeine. So you don't have to stop having your coffee, but if you remember the morning, your cortisol is at its, already at its highest, your blood sugar is at its most vulnerable. So please stop having coffee on an empty stomach. If you do anything, take anything from this talk tonight, it's about vitamin D over the winter months and stop having caffeine on an empty stomach. That includes tea. So have some food first and then have your caffeine um, and, you know, really restricting it. I say 2 p.m. here. I'm being quite generous. If you're if you work with me clinically, it's normally 11 a.m. And the reason for that being that some people have genetic um, just in their genetic makeup. They're not that great at breaking down caffeine. So coffee that they have for some, it can take even 10 or 12 hours to work through that caffeine. So you're having a coffee in the afternoon at 2 p.m. could still be in your system at 2 a.m. or midnight or 10 p.m. when you're trying to go to sleep. So really trying to limit that um, or, or restrict the timing that you do that. So I hope that you feel as though there are things you can do. I love telling people that our bodies are constantly breaking down and rebuilding. You technically get seven different skeletons in your whole life, which is absolutely mind blowing because even your bones are breaking down and rebuilding. So your body is open to being influenced. It's just about understanding you know, what you can do in each system and also really working on, you know, what is different about you, what is unique, what's going on with your gut, what's happening with your hormones, 
Do you have carbohydrate sugar sensitivities or food sensitivities? Do you have difficulty with something called methylation? Um, you know, what's going on with you as an individual that is maybe getting in the way of the body, just kind of being able to self-regulate in that way. Or as I said, you can get kind of stuck in these little cycles and it's kind of hard for the body to get itself out and needs a little bit of extra support. Um, so there's lots that can be done. Um, and I hope that you've taken that from tonight. Uh, as I said, you know, I work privately.